Well, g'day, curd nerds. G'day, curd nerds. Well, 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 g'day, curd nerds, and welcome back to Ask the Cheese Man. This is episode 215. My goodness, what a journey so far. It's been absolutely lovely. Uh, instead of reading out the uh, thank yous, big thank you to Dominic and Steve and to Jaylene. Uh, thank you very much for all your financial support uh, during the show. Now, I'm Gavin Weber, and I'm the host of the show. And today, I'm going to be attempting to answer your home cheese-making questions as we do. All righty. Uh, some big announcements today. Um, I made it into the Better Way newsletter or Titbits. Or tit Titbits? Yeah, that's it. So it's small pieces of information uh, over at, uh, I think, New England Cheese Making Supply. Uh, issued the little newsletter that I'm subscribed to, and it featured my Red Windsor, which was very exciting. So that was good fun. A, another exciting thing that's coming up, don't forget the 12 Hours of Cheese. I've been working diligently to get it all ready. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I'm ready to show you what all the sessions are. So let's have a look at that. I'm very excited to present this. It's a bit rough, <laughs> but that's okay. Rough's good. Um, sharing. Right, what am I doing here? Sharing my window. Rightio, as you can see, uh, the 12 hours of cheese. So it, well, goes for 12 hours. It's going to be live my time, Sunday the 12th. Uh, for some of you, it will be Saturday the 11th. Um, so there are 12, well, more than 12 schedules, schedule sessions. I'll get the right in a minute. Goodness me. Um, so we'll have a live intro and then, uh, first beginner session is, uh, Quark and, uh, Curran Jan Creamy, which is invented by, uh, Charlie, who's in the chat today, Charlie Pace. And then we've got a live interview with Jennifer Merch from Virginia in the USA. Then another live interview with uh, Patricia Gauchi. Yeah, she's from Nova Scotia, and she's in the chat too. We've got a an interview straight after that. It's because I had to jam them all in because of time zones. Uh, Ruth Cohen from San Francisco in California. I'm not sure if Ruth's in the chat today. I can't see her. Um, and then we've got a, another beginner's session. Then we've got a live smoked cheese taste test. I'm smoke some cheese. Um, and an Ask the Cheese Man Q&A session. Then we've got an intermediate cheese session, which goes for an hour, so I can go for a taller break. <laughs> Not going to take an hour, of course. Uh, and then we've got an interview with Tracy Johnson, who's in the chat today under the Cheese Needs uh, banner, cheeseneeds.com, I think. Um, so Tracy, it'd be lovely to chat to Tracy. Then we've got another intermediate cheese session. And then we've got an interview... Uh, with John Wilson uh, from Campot in Cambodia, who has an artisan cheese factory. So that'll be interesting to talk to John. Uh, then we've got a, a final 30-minute uh, mould ripen session where we're going to look at chili brie and a little bit of a promo. And then we've got an interview, last interview, with Tutu Said uh, from Bangladesh. And he runs a, uh, a, cheese, uh, a cheese factory as well called Tutu's Artisan Cheese, uh, and he's one of the very few artisan cheese makers in Bangladesh. So that'll be very exciting. And then we've got a 30-minute wrap-up at the end. So I'm very excited about all of that. Um, it's going to be a big, big day. Uh, I'll be having to get out of bed an hour earlier than I normally do for the Sunday morning live stream, uh, as we have today. But it'll be very... Very exciting. I'm all the I, my fingers crossed. I hope all the live streams go okay. All the interviews, I mean, um, and uh, if any of those who are being interviewed are watching, if they want to set up a session to test their gear, then I'm quite happy to do that during the week. So just let me know. So that'll be fun. What else do we have? Um, 
that's about it. So let's get on with the questions. Well, we'll say g'day to g'day, g'day. <coughs> excuse me, to a few people. Um, uh, first person who was on the stream this morning at 7.30, my time, was Cele uh, Cease. Hello, Cease. Lovely to see you. Uh, and then Monique and Robert and Bill. G'day. And Wendy. Hello, Wendy. And Celeste. Uh, who else have we got? We've got Charlie and ooh, who else? We've got Tracy from Cheese Needs. Uh, and then I think I kick into, we've got Paul. Hello, Paul. Uh, Cheryl. Hello, Cheryl. Manuel, Annette, Patricia, of course. Uh, Alicia. Uh, Robert M. Uh, this is hello from Robert and Melissa. So it's Robert and Melissa. Lovely. Um, John, hello, John. We got Megan. Good morning, Jody. Uh, Sherry, hello, Sherry. Judy, hello, Judy. Uh, Carol and who else? Julia and Matisse. Goodness me, who else? Fun Pants 94, Nicola, Johnny, and Glenn. Hello to all of you. Um, that'll do, and then we'll get into the questions now. There is a question. Oh, sorry, I forgot to mention. Don't forget that at uh, 30 minutes past the hour or 8.30 my time, there will be the gallery. Um, we've got some interesting photos and interest, interesting questions and some show and tell. Uh, so those have been sent in by you, the home cheese maker. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'll show those and that'll be good. Now, what I am hoping for next week or straight after this show i'm going to show everybody how to send in their home cheese making pictures uh because we've only got what two two q a sessions during the 12 hours of cheese there's more interviews this year than there was last year um i will be uh having a gallery session so send your photos in um i'll show you how to do that um after we have the gallery session today um and i'll also be doing a a small promo video during the week that I'll release uh, on you on the YouTube channel and on Facebook, uh, and that'll show people how to send in gallery photos if they want to do that as well for the Q and A session. So don't forget that that is coming up as well. Okay, let's get to some questions. Um, first question is from Robert Delucci, and I can't show it because he hasn't asked it after the stream shard sh started, unless he wants to do it now, and then I can pop it up on the screen, but. I'll start it off. Said uh, Robert says I made a parmesan cheese. It's four weeks young. I'm keeping it in a ripening container at ten to twelve. It keeps getting blue mold and small darker spots. I clean with brine and vinegar weekly and have oiled it. How do I stop the mold returning? Uh, well, you don't. <laughs> um, it keeps coming back because the cheese is moist at this early stage of its life. That's why we've got it in the ripening box. Humidity has got to be fairly low. Well, not low, um, you know, around 70%. It's not a really high humidity cheese. Uh, it just stops the rind from um, from drying out and cracking. Um, but the olive oil is a good start because that stops mold from growing on the outside. Um, also helps with the drying process. So once you get to about, um, what is it, about a month, uh, how many weeks? You've got four weeks. So if you think the rind is dry enough, Robert, then it's probably safe to vacuum pack or wax it. Because remember, the real Parmesan wheels, you know, weigh about 70 kilograms. They're massive. And they will retain, retain their moisture through the aging of the cheese. Um, our small, you know, what, one kilo, one and a half kilo cheese wheels will tend to dry out over the 12 months of aging. So uh, it's best to either vacuum pack or... Uh, or wax the cheese. So hope that helps, mate. Okay, I'm sure we've got another question here. Start throwing them at me. Um, this one's from Cheryl. And Cheryl says, I followed the recipe for feta, but it tastes very salty. Is there anything I can do to save it? You know what? Feta is salty. Uh, it is a very salty cheese, the real feta from Greece. Um, the, you know, the... The versions we get in, uh, you know, in Australia and the US and Canada are all watered down versions of feta. They're not the real thing. You get real feta from Greece and it is salty as all get out. However, 
What you can do to get rid of some of the salt is soak your feta in some milk, just plain milk, you know, out of the carton. Um, do that for about an hour. Um, hopefully it won't, you know, start going, um, uh, what is it, slimy on the outside. It should be fine. Um, but, yeah, the milk will absorb some of the salt back out of the cheese and it'll taste okay. Um, but what you need to do, make sure that it is stored or when you initially brine it, uh, it's a 10% brine solution. And in the Real Greek Feta video that I've got, uh, just look for Real Greek Feta uh, and you'll see that the brine solution, there's a recipe for the brine solution for a 10% brine um, or there's brine rest, uh, there's uh, instructions for making a 10% brine in my book, Keep Calm and Make Cheese. So you can go and check that out. But hopefully that helps, Cheryl. So next time, 10% brine solution. If you did it this time and it was still salty, the minimum you can go down to without the cheese spoiling is an 8% brine solution. So that's why. Okay. Uh, John's got a question. Uh, it says, why is it, why is it that hard cheeses take so long to make compared to soft, quick cheeses that's quick to make? Okay. So I think it's I bet you're talking about the flavor, John. So uh, it, the harder cheeses take time. Uh, for the enzymes within them, so the enzyme from the rennet, the enzymes from the uh, deceased lactic bacteria, um, and they all take time to break down the proteins and fats in the cheese. It's a time thing. Nothing you can do to speed it up. Maybe temperature. Uh, the higher the temperature, the faster it ripens, but it goes rancid faster as well. So, uh, it takes time to break down those proteins and fats. With fresh, soft cheeses, you don't have that breakdown of the fats and proteins. And you just have very simple flavours. But with harder cheese, semi-hard and harder cheeses, you have more complex flavours because of the breakdowns of those fats and proteins. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, next question is from Annette. And Annette says... Um, I just opened my Edom and was disappointed to find a big air gap in the middle. Smells great, tastes good, but is it going to be safe to eat? Indeed it is. It is going to be safe to eat, Annette. What you have there is a case of, um, of late-blown cheese. And this happens a lot with um, the Dutch-style cheeses, so the Edoms, the Gouders, or Gouda, um, Leodama, all those sort of... Um, I've even seen it happen to Colby. So all those washed curd cheeses uh, and uh, some alpine cheeses as well tend to go through late blowing. Now, what it is, late blowing is a, uh, it's from a bacteria uh, called, oh, can't remember at the moment. <laughs> My brain's gone blank. It's too early on a Sunday morning. But uh if you have a look at uh, Protect, there's a, a latest video on uh, Gouda and Graviera and I think even the Guidos. I may have added this protective culture. And what that does, it kills off any bad bacteria, yeasts and moulds um, on and in the cheese and stops late blowing. Uh, the version I've got is from Sacco. It's called LPRA. Um, and you can find that on our website at littlegreenworkshops.com.au. Um, but there is also other substitutes, which is the same. The, the bacteria you're looking for, the lactobacteria, is Lactobacillus lactis subspecies rhamnosus. Yeah, get that around you. Yeah? And there's another one in the LPRA culture called Lactobacillus lactis subspecies plantarum. So those two cultures... Um, uh, stop unwanted bacterias and late blowing and CO2 development and stuff like that in Dutch style and Alpine style cheeses. So that's what's happened. Yep, safe to eat. I've had that happen many times before, before I understood what protective cultures were. And uh, yeah, so go for it, eat it, but uh, pick, up some, um, pick up some protective culture for those styles of cheeses next time. Okay. Um, now, the next one's from Carol, and Carol says, I just wanted to pop in and say I'm new to cheese making. I've made queso fresco so far, 
Uh, I must say, oh, thank you, Cheryl, for the uh, super chat. I'll just turn that off. You're the first to get the curd nerd light going today. <laughs> Very exciting. Um, so uh, back to Carol's question. Uh, I must say I've watched many of your videos and feel uh, real blessed towards you for sharing your gift and knowledge with us. Thank you. Uh, looking forward to learning more. And I haven't got the rest of the question because Facebook doesn't truncate, it truncates the question. So sorry about the last bit. If you want to ask that a little bit later on, I'll get to it. Uh, now we've got Cheryl's question. She has paid for it. $10. Oops, wrong one, that one. There we go. Thank you very much, Cheryl, for your $10 US. It says, I'm building a wood smoker to cold smoke cheese. Besides powder, what is a good cheese to smoke? Oh, look, any semi-hard, hard cheese. Um, so all cheddar tastes amazing smoked. Um, I've had smoked Havati. Uh, anything that, yeah, anything that's not really hard. So like things like Parmesan, Romano, um, the cheese that can't be mentioned, Grana Padano, um, uh, Pecorino Romano, those really hard cheeses won't absorb the carbon and the smoke and the smoky flavors very well. It's like semi hard cheeses that still have a little bit of moisture in them, they will absorb that smoke a lot, much, much better. So, hope that answers your question, Cheryl. Thank you so much. Um, oh, Halu Jack John Jackson says halloumi is a great cheese to smoke, indeed, it is very good. Um, and uh, Jim says, that just to follow up on the late-blown bit, it says, uh, late-blown bacteria comes from cows eating fermented silage, I've heard. Yes, indeed. Can also come from, I know that's early blown, comes from the teats and feces and stuff like that. So, yeah, cows eating fermented silage, which is grass that's been fermented under heat. Uh, my dad used to make it. I grew up on a dairy farm and he used to make silage. Uh, at the end of every summer, uh, and it was a good feed for the cows during the winter months so uh it says is there a time of the year that the dairy farmers have that more seems to be a popular question late spring so um it's given as a feed supplement well it used to be when i was a kid that was a long time ago now um dad used to feed the cows uh silage uh in winter so uh, as a feed supplement um, to the hay, because, you know, the grass wouldn't grow very well. It doesn't snow here in, uh, in where I lived in Australia. I was in the uh, Loxton in South Australia is where I grew up. And that Loxton North was where the dairy farm is. It's not any longer there anymore. Um, but, yeah, because the grass wasn't growing, um, uh, the, they got hay and they've got, um, uh, they got silage. And in the late summer when the grass was all dead even though we had some irrigation so uh they also got um uh silage so dad would make it in when it rained was mostly spring um and uh yeah so so it'll be late summer and then late winter were the two times that he would use silage so that's just from experience uh if anybody else has got any knowledge on that just throw it into the chat and that will help out jim Okay, um, more questions, of course. Um, let's have a look. Uh, Bill says, looks like a great lineup for the 12 hours. Indeed, I'm, I'm very excited. There's so many interesting people this year. You know, last year uh, I did the 12 hours of cheese in uh, July and I had three guests and that was so much fun and i learned so much you know just talking to other cheesemakers it's a um not a lonely life i suppose but uh you know when you make cheese by yourself and the feedback you don't you know you don't get feedback you don't know many other cheesemakers and i think that's why this community is so enjoyable because we get to talk about our passion you know cheese making so even though I'm the host, I think that you guys are all the guests and you answer each other's questions in the chat and it's so much fun. So uh, it's great. So we do have another super chat and it's just gone off. So this one, let's get to that one before we get to the next question. 
Thank you, Bill, for that. Um, that's from Cheryl. I'll kill a light. Um, thank you, Cheryl, again. What is the best way to control the humidity in a wine fridge? I'm struggling. Yeah, wine fridges tend to um, remove the humidity because they're for wine. Um, they can be used for cheese, of course. I did use one in the early days. Uh, to keep the humidity up, there's only a couple of ways you can really do it, and that is um, uh, there's a couple of things. You can get a humidifier, uh, which pumps you know uh, vaporized air into with, with water vapor uh, into the cheese fridge and has a fairly high humidity. A little bit difficult to control. There are controls on the humidifier that you can tune it back, especially if there's ones made for cheeses, so that's good. Do that. If you want to, ripen your cheeses naturally within the, the fridge. What I do, Cheryl, I just, I've just i got a normal refrigerator. So I've got one of those dorm fridges or bar fridges that uh, just sits under the counter. It's only, what was it, a 44-litre fridge, something like that. Um, don't know what that is in gallons. but um, So I just ripen all the ones that need the humidity um, that I haven't vacuum packed or haven't um, waxed, they don't need any extra humidity. Um, the ones that I've got in that naturally ripened or mold ripened or washed rind, um, then I'd put them in the ripening box. You know, the red ripening box, you've seen all the videos. And then underneath the mat that the cheese sits on, I've got a damp uh, cloth. So it's a dish cloth that's brand new, just fresh off the roll. Um, and that's moist, and then every week I make sure that that stays moist. And I've had a hygrometer in the box, and it stays at about 80%, so 80% relative humidity, so it's perfect um, during the life of the cheese. So that's the best way to get around it uh, if you've got a, a cheese fridge. Okay. Uh, it's good to see people who are answering questions put three Qs in front of their thing. It makes it a little bit easier to... Um, uh, to find the questions. So that is great. So if you can do that, um, Curd Nerds, that would be most excellent. And some people have started to do that, which is fantastic. Um, okay, next question is from... And where is it? I think Matisse was the last one. Uh no, maybe. Uh, John, had another question. Uh, says, is there a way to make hard cheese in a quick fashion like soft cheese? Uh, there's only a couple that I know of, and they don't have the complex flavours that the um, fully ripe and hard cheeses. So there's one called Guido's. Guido's hard Italian cheese was made with a thermophilic culture, and that takes three weeks to mature. It's a nice table cheese. It's tasty enough. Okay. Okay. Uh, the other one that I really like and that does have a lot of flavour is called Kefili. Uh And Kefili is a great cheese. Um, it's I, The video's on the channel. Just go and have a look. There's a 2019 version, which is the better, and it's a larger batch of milk than the previous one that I have made. So Kefili, look for that. C-A-E-P-H-I-L-L-Y. Kefili. It's a Welsh cheese. Very nice. Three weeks old. Salty, tasty, crumbly, very good. So there's a couple of cheeses. Oh, and the other one that is different, but is flavoursome and it's kind of like a hard cheese is Bel Paese. So check the, that recipe out as well. Uh, it means beautiful country. Uh, it's an Italian cheese and you can mature that exclusively in the kitchen fridge. So thank you, John. Um, okay, next question is from Matisse says, hey, Gavin, currently making my first hard cheese. Thanks for all your help. How did you learn your cheese making skills? Ah, good question. So in, in my first book, Keep Calm and Make Cheese, uh, the full story is in there. Um, but short story is I went and did a cheese making course at the local community centre. It was just like one of those all day things. And I learned how to make cheese. There were so many people... There's probably about, what, 12 people learning how to make cheese. And these two lovely old ladies called Dorothy and Lorraine uh, had a bit of a travelling road show. They'd go from community centre in each town and and teach how to make basic cheese making. So the very first cheese I learnt to make was a feta or a style of feta. It was like a white pressed cheese. Um, the press they used on the day, 
was a car jack upside down uh, and they squeeze the bejeebas out of the cheese just to get it into a solid form. There was so much fat loss that the cheese was kind of a bit bland. But anyway, I brined the cheese and I look, I was hooked after that first one. Um, and then I went on a subsequent course about four months later after I'd made a few cheeses. Um, and I went and I made a blue cheese. So I made a Stilton style style very rough style stilton um and that was delicious as well so you know i was really hooked from there on i made cheese even before i started making videos probably for about a year um just making cheese every weekend i was really enjoying it and then as i thought well why i can i'm sure i can teach people how to make this i've just learned why not use youtube and the rest is history so there you go so thanks, Matisse, for asking that question. Uh, the next question is from... Uh, this one's from Andrew. And Andrew says, um, I've made your cheese and desist cheese. <laughs> I love that. Um, recently, it's puffed up in the vacuum seal bag and it's gone quite spongy. Oh, my goodness. Uh, it still has a few months left to mature. What do I do here? If it's puffed up in the bag, that means there's some sort of carbon dioxide or hydrogen development in the cheese, and that's not good. So take it out of the vacuum pack bag. Have a look at it. It should be dry on the outside. That cheese was dry when I put it into the vacuum pack. Um, and, and there's not much more I can say about that except let it air dry again. If it feels spongy, then that's not good as well. So there may be something internally wrong with it, uh, may be infected with something. I'm not sure, but you'll have to check it. So if it feels firm-ish, then continue to dry it and then, um, you know, vacuum pack it again after it's air dried. Um, currently, you know, I, no, there's no pictures. Very hard to check, Andrew. Um but yeah, I'll have to leave it to your informed decision. It should be hard. It's a hard cheese. The curds should have been very small when you pressed the cheese. Very minimum moisture. So if it's spongy, there's something going on there somewhere and it's not quite good. Um, okay, sorry for that. But yeah, that, that's that's where it's at. Uh, big g'day to... Um, who we got there? Jim Jackson, I think, who's uh, been a member, a YouTube member, uh, paid member for 31 months. Thank you, Jim. Um, next question is uh, from uh, Megan. Hello, Megan. Uh, what was your deciding factors when you got into cheese making? And do you only use your cheese you your your made now? You you've made. Um, Deciding factors when getting into cheese. Oh, look, it was just, it was because I wanted to know what was in my food. At the time, I was doing this 160-kilometre um, or 100-mile challenge. I was trying to um, source the vast majority of our food from within 100 miles of where I lived. Um, and I, unfortunately, it was during a drought, so it was a bit hard to do. Uh, and that included cheese. Uh, from what I could tell, within our 100 um, um, miles or 160 kilometers for us here in the metric world. Uh, it was difficult. There weren't at the time when I did it. Um, this was way back in um, oh early early 2000s. Yeah, the start of just the turn of the century, and um, there there weren't a lot of artisan cheesemakers. That's the alarm for the gallery. We'll get to that in a second. So there weren't a lot of um, artisan cheesemakers in that zone. I think there was one, um, and I think it was Meredith Dairy, uh, who make that fantastic um, marinated goat cheese. So, um, yeah, so uh, other than processed cheese factories, which were in the city, and I didn't want to do processed cheese. I wanted to know what was in our cheese. So I decided I wanted to learn how to make cheese ourselves. So that was the fact of it. Now, do I only eat cheese that we've made? No, I don't, because... Um, I like to seek out artisan cheesemakers and try their fare because that will help me improve my own cheesemaking skills. 
if I can figure out and replicate how they made their cheese, then I'll try that and then I'll share it all with you. So, yeah, always try, don't just eat your own cheese. Eat other cheese as well because you'll never learn otherwise. Um, but, yeah, thank you, Megan. Fantastic question. Um, and it's time for the gallery. So let's uh, cue that up, get that going. Love a good gallery. Um, and uh, we've got questions and answers and let's get all these up as well and take me two seconds sorry ladies and gentlemen um okay so the first one and i better share the screen first oh, i'm a duffer I hope this doesn't bode well for next week goodness me right here we go right yeah so first picture is a fridge it's very exciting isn't it okay so uh, the question this was sent in by chris Chris Cardona says, uh, good morning, Gavin. Firstly, I'd like to say thank you for devoting so much of your time to making YouTube videos to educate people like me. You're most welcome, Chris. I find your videos so interesting, helpful, engaging, and yes, I subscribed. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, says, I must be going through a midlife crisis as I'm taking up two more hobbies, cheese making and charcuterie. Can I ask, can I store cheese in the same chamber as salami uh, for aging temperatures are very similar 12 to 13 degrees celsius with 70 to 80 percent humidity below is my drying chamber where i can maintain constant temperatures and levels kind regards chris okay chris yes the answer is yes uh you can indeed store your cheeses in that fridge now a bit of a caveat though remembering that salami gets all sorts of molds on the outside i know when i've made salami before it gets a white mold on the outside, could be penicillium candidum, could be geotrichum candidum, which is a yeast, and you get that bloom on the outside of your salami. Now, that could potentially infect other cheeses if you are naturally aging them in your cheese fridge. However, if you're just vacuum packing and uh, waxing your cheese or you're using ripening containers, there is no issues whatsoever of using your salami fridge or chartoucherie fridge to uh, mature your cheese. So. Hopefully that helps. All right, next uh, photo is, oh, this is good looking. This is from Jesse. And Jesse says, hi, Gavin, I'm working on my a creation of my own. It is a Colby and I've soaked the curds in a combination of Earl Grey and breakfast tea in a similar technique to the port in your Red Windsor. Thanks for your advice last week. Advice last week. I've retained... Sorry, I've refrained from including an internal layer of honey, which I told Jesse that it would probably ferment and that would be bad. Um, I will be following the honey coating method used by Mary Carlin for her honey rubbed Montasio. Um, here is the cheese after drying and before entering the cave. I'll update you on developments as I go. Thanks for your help, Jesse. So let's uh, just zoom in a bit. A little bit blurry, but it looks that tea, the tannins from the tea have stained the cheese, and I think that it'll look really nice on the inside. Hopefully, there's not too much bitterness from the tea that it's been soaked in. Um, so, yeah, the time will tell. But thank you so much, Jesse, for sending that in. Uh, the next photo is from, this is from Josh. And uh, Josh, is, Josh is in South Australia. Thank you, Josh, for sending this in. Uh, says, hi, Gavin. Long time, long time no cheese picks. <laughs> of course. Uh, I've been hard at work on long age cheeses, cheddars and parmesans of late. So a bit lacking in the picture department, but I thought I'd send along a few picks for the next episode or save them for the 12 hours of cheese if you prefer. I haven't. Um, here are a couple of pics of some halloumi that I made a little while ago, my first attempt at such a cheese. Picture number one, which is this one, is uh, pressed, cut, salted and minted using mint from the garden, dried the night before and draining on a rack. I will work on my uneven cutting skills. I think they look perfect, actually, Josh. Uh, and picture number two, coming up, is... Cut into strips and lightly fried in a pan. They had a great squeakiness on the teeth, but a little salty by themselves. We chop them up and add them to a salad for lunch 
and it tastes superb. All in all, fairly simple, quick, rewarding. Highly recommended if you ever tried, if you've never tried making it. Regards, Josh. Well, indeed, I have. There's quite a few recipes there, uh, Josh, on the channel. Um, and uh, yeah, it is a great cheese. A nice, simple, quick cheese that you can make the same day and eat it the same day. So great cheese. All right, back to the gallery. Uh, this one's rather small. Let's just zoom that in a little bit. A little bit blurry, but it's okay. This one's from Melissa. Uh, Melissa, say, Melissa says, hi, uh, I am new to cheese making. I have been buying my supplies from Little Green Workshops. Well done. Thank you uh, for your patronage, uh, Melissa. And I just wanted to show you my chili pepper jack that I made this weekend using a recipe except that I rubbed it with oil and Tabasco, Woo! goodness me, and then salted it with pink Himalayan salt. Well, I think it looks lovely. I uh, wish it was a little bit clearer, but it is amazing. It's a great looking cheese. You haven't got that chipotle, you know, powdered rub on the outside, which is probably a good thing because mine probably overdeveloped in acid. So, and it became really crumbly. So hopefully that doesn't happen to you uh, and your cheese. Uh, continues to age and, and looks amazing. Thank you, Melissa, for sending that in. And, oh, there's another shot of the cheese, a different angle. Let's just zoom in a little bit there. And, yeah, you can see that there's a little bit of pink tinge, not just from the chilies, but from the uh, the pink Himalayan salt. So, yeah, good use of the stuff they've got. All right, this one was sent in by Tracy Johnson. It's the last photo of the gallery. Uh, let's just see if we can get rid of all that. Oh, there we go. It says, hi, Gav. I came up with this idea for Belpa cannoli, um, a round egg box. Very nice. I didn't even know you could buy plastic egg boxes. Um, all the ones here we've got in Australia are all um, uh, cardboard, recycled cardboard. Anyway, so, uh, so Belpa cannoli with a flat bottom. Oh, honey, no. Um, in store if you don't have one. Uh, oh, in store now if you don't have one. Oh, okay. You're selling it in your cheeseneeds.com store. Well done. Um, so what are they? Let's have a look. So from left to right, we've got two pepper. So these ones here, these are pepper. Looks like that, um, you know, you can get that mixed peppercorn colors because there's a bit of red, brown, and black in there, which looks excellent. The second ones are paprika. And I don't know if that's like smoky paprika, but uh, it looks good. Uh, number the six, one, two, three, four, five, six. They're Italian herbs, so that'll probably be a mix of um, what rosemary, thyme, oregano, maybe some bas dried basil. Yeah, you get the general idea. Um, and one lonely paprika and onion and chili, which is this one. That'll be spicy. But that is a great way so they don't get flat bottoms. Mine got it flat bottoms. But, yeah, well done. Great suggestion, Tracy. Thank you so much. So that is the gallery. Um, thank you, everybody, for sending in your photos today to the gallery. Now, how do you send a picture to me? Right. It's pretty easy. Let me show you. Okay. Um, so all you do is go to the YouTube channel, my YouTube channel, of course, nobody else's because you won't be able to do it. Um, so, uh, you just go to the about tab just here. Hopefully you can see my little pointer. There it is. We go to the about tab and down here, it says details for business inquiries, sign in to see the email address. So you must be signed into your Gmail account or Google account, whatever you got. Whatever you log into YouTube to send me a comment, that's the account you use. Look, you may just see the email address if you're already logged in. So sign in there, send me an email to that email address only, and that's the one. Uh, no others, just that one. So please send your photos. And like I said, next week, um, we'll have a nice big gallery. We've got the time. So shoot in your photos for... The 12 hours of cheese. That'll be very exciting. I'm looking forward to it. So, yeah, gallery photos, send them in. All righty. So let's get back. What time is it? The time. We've got 20 minutes left today. 
So let's get into some more questions. We do have some. Um, ba -ba -ba. Let's have a look. Uh, next question. We did the one from Megan. Um, uh, Julia has a comment for Cheryl. Says, I took the brine down to 10%. This is uh, regarding her feta. Um, and it was a lot better. Yeah, indeed. 10% is on the money as far as feta goes. If you use an 18% solution, yeah, it is a bit too salty. Because you've got to remember with feta, you store it in the brine. It stays there forever and a day until you want to eat it. Okay. So um, Robert says, uh, and we got another super chat from Cheryl. Thank you, Cheryl. I'll get to that in a second. Thank you so much. For the $20. Um, Robert says, what cheese would you recommend I make during the 12 hours of cheese making? I was thinking of chili Edam, uh, Oaxaca and Sage Derby. I tell you what, that's a, a big stretch. Um, making Edam takes a long time um, because you've got to, uh, it's not, is it, you press it under the way as well to stop the, um, uh, it just helps it compress it. Um, and Sage Derby takes a while as well. So Oaxaca, yeah, you can knock that out. No problems at all, Robert. So, yeah, good ideas. Um, making cheese during the show. <laughs> Be something to do while you're watching. Um, uh, Charlie says, Gavin, a few shows back you mentioned the amount of protein the milk has an effect on its melting properties. Can you elaborate on that? Um, yeah, so the more protein in the milk, the more it melts, the less um it doesn't so i don't have much more than that i've got to do some more research on that charlie sorry i don't have anything more than that at the moment um but yeah um that's just what i learned and it was from uh where's the book oh, i don't have it with me because I, I took it away on my birthday weekend and and started reading it so i will do some more research so charlie good question it sounds like a great um uh, learning video, one of those little ones I do. Uh, melting. Thanks, mate, for the prompter. Um, Cheryl, and I'll get to your super chat in a second, says, I love your Keep Karma Make Cheese book. Hopefully you've got the second one as well, Cheryl, the Keep Karma Make More Cheese. There's so much more in that book as well. It's double the size of the first book. So, um, so yeah, so Cheryl's got a super chat and says... Thank you. $20 US. Thank you so much. So kind, Cheryl. Uh, I am eating spaghetti uh, and wishing my parmesan was ready one month to go. I bet it is going to be amazing. Best parmesan ever. Well done. Okay. Um, more questions. Uh, ba -ba -ba. This one is from John. And John says, odd question, can you jar or can cheese? Look, I have seen cheese in a can. <laughs> I don't know how they do it, uh, but I have seen it in a can and it tastes disgusting. Uh, in a jar, yes, you can. So uh, have a look at my recipe for Persian feta. And that is a cheese marinated in oil. It does not go in the cupboard. You have to keep it in the fridge um, or it will kind of run away, ferment and taste really sickly, if that's the right word. I did leave one in the fridge. You can actually get botulism in the olive oil and that's not good. So keep it in the fridge. Um, the oil that I use is a mix of sunflower and olive oil. And that stops the olive oil from going solid in the fridge. Olive oil tends to solidify at low temperatures. So whereas sunflower oil doesn't. Uh, so yes, yes, you can put cheese in a jar, but have a look at the Persian feta. It's great. Um, and uh, thank you, Annette, for the order over on Little Green Cheese. I'm oh, sorry, Little Green Cheese, Little Green Workshops. I am watching what's going on there as well okay uh next question is from 
uh, oh, statement from Megan says, low fat cheeses are amazing. Freeze dried. Oh, I've never freeze dried cheese before. That's amazing. Herb says, a belated hello, my fellow curd nerds. Thank you, Herb. Lovely to see you on the chat today. Uh, Chris and uh, what's that? Cthulhu. <laughs> That's that funny monster. Um, have you ever tried making vegan cheese? Uh, I did make a vegan cream cheese once, uh, and there is a video. Um, but yeah, interesting. Uh, I haven't made any other vegan cheeses. Uh, Jim, g'day. How are you, mate? Trust the lady Kim is doing well uh, with the doggies. Yes, she is. She's looking after the doggies at the moment. And it was her birthday on Friday. It was amazing. Um, I'm going to put up a little bit of a video over on the Gavin and Kim channel, our vlog channel. We really haven't done much with that this year after Kim told her story about her breast cancer. Um, but, yeah, we're going to start putting up um, some more stuff from around here. So, yeah, I'm gonna I'm putting together today a little video on our uh, her birthday trip. So that was that was special. Friday night, we stayed overnight in a cottage. It was really lovely, beautiful little place. The food, we went to the Olinda Tea House. So anybody in Melbourne who's ever been to the Olinda Tea House, which is really a Chinese restaurant, <laughs> and the food is amazing, beautiful food if you're into Chinese cuisine. Oh. Oh, so good. Um, thank you, Jim. Appreciate it, mate. Uh, question from Austin says, what to do with all the way? Well, I do have a video in production at the moment. It's a bit of a running gag. I've been promising to make it for about three years. I think it's called uh, Ways with Way. You can do lots of stuff with Way. Um, and I'm sure there's people in the comments that will um, throw their two bobs worth in um, or two cents and um, uh, share. All right. Um, I think Patricia is in here somewhere asking, um, where is it? I've seen it before. Patricia, where are you? So something about, um, here it is. There's a question. Uh, I wanted to get this one. Planning anything special to mark 300 subscribers? Eh? Close. Close. Uh, about 800 subscribers away. Uh, I should reach that. Well, I don't think I'll re reach it next week. I, re I wanted to celebrate it during the 12 hours of cheese, but I don't think I'll get there unless all of you good folk, all you great cheese ner ner curd nerds, um, tell all your friends and tell them all to subscribe. I don't know if that's going to happen, but could do. That would be great. But yeah, um, um, am I planning anything? I want to. I want to do a celebratory video because... 300 is just an amazing milestone as far for a cheese channel. Goodness me, you know, we're not popular. It's, it's a niche hobby that not everybody gets into. There's only a few videos on the channel that constantly get lots and lots of views, and that's the Parmesan and the Cheddar, cheddar video. The other ones I release, really only the cheesemakers watch it and then make it. But, you know, of that that regular, regularly watch videos is probably about between, between 10,000 and 30,000 people that watch it to make the video. The rest watch it for entertainment value, I suppose. But am I planning anything? I want to. I'm think got to think about it. But at the moment, I'm focused 100% on the 12 hours of cheese. I just want to absolutely get that right next week. So that'll be good fun. Whew. But thank you, Patricia, for asking. Yes, the juices are flowing for that. So, all right, let's see. There are some more questions. I've got, what, 10 minutes to go. Um, uh, question from John. And John says, how can someone go about inventing their own style of cheese? Uh, look, well, all cheeses are variations on a theme, basically. Milk, rennet, cultures whether they be naturally occurring in the raw milk or you add them in um, to get the different flavors. How, how do you do, how do you, how do you make it yourself? Oh, well, you know, you come up with an idea and think, well, I'll give it a try. Experimentation. That is how most things are created. Um, and to perfect it, you need to experiment some more. So, uh, I, you know, look, I've made a few cheeses myself, um, a few of the cheese recipes. So the Petite Blue, 
is one of my own creations and a lot of people have replicated it and think it's amazing. I thought it was amazing. It was a great little blue cheese. Very runny and gooey on the inside with a distinct blue flavour, uh, very similar to a runny camembert or a washed rind cheese, but it was blue, so that was lovely. Uh, Farmhouse Cheddar Blue was another one of my cre creations. I just modified a recipe, added some penicillium rogue 40, beautiful marbling through a cheddar style cheese, and that was just beautiful. There are so many other ones. I think there's some other ones that are sim... Um, what was the other one? Bloomy Goat Blue, but I think that was variations on a theme. I didn't fully create that myself. There, are, I think there are other cheeses out there that people have made that have that. Um, but yeah, I'm sure there's some other ones. I'm sure there's some other recipes that I've made. I've just forgotten. You know, old head now. I had my birthday a couple of weeks ago, so, you know. But how do you go about it? Like I said, experimentation. Get the basics right first. Make some from recipes get them right, get them tasting right, and then you'll start to understand. Read lots of books on cheese making, uh, a great one to learn the basics and how to understand what goes into cheese making and what changes things is from Giannikos Caldwell, and it's called, um, what is it called? Um, artisan, uh, cheeses for the Artisan Cheesemaker or something like that. Thank you, Cheryl, for another super chat there. Let's just kill the light before everybody goes funny. Um, but, yeah, thanks, John. Great question. Um, so down to Cheryl's super chat here says, oh, my God, everybody should make cheese. I think so. Um, it's because of you I am making cheese. Well, you and Tails from Green Valley making cheeses in the 1600s. Excellent. Um, I think that's a book. Um but thank you, Cheryl. I, I really appreciate it. And thank you so much for all the super chats today. It's been great. Um, another question. Uh, uh, little Green Cheese is a Martian's favourite snack. Indeed, I actually have a website called Little Green Cheese. But, yeah, uh, uh, Little Green Cheese... Not very appetizing. Also, Dr. Garus, Dr. Zeus copyrighted that. I don't think so. I've got a website with a name on it. Uh, but yeah, yeah. I, I don't know if anybody knew. Let's have a look. Because um, where is it? Let's have a look. Little Green Cheese. Um, this is me. Let's have a look. I'll share and share and share. So I do have a website that I run and own. Uh, cool Little Green Cheese. Let's Get rid of the ads. This is it. it says cheese making home with Gavin Weber, the cheese maker. That's me. So uh, you know, I've got the features of the uh, YouTube videos. We've got podcast episodes on there, latest podcast episodes. I know they're a bit old, but I'll get around to recording some more soon. Uh, cheese making recipes. We've got kits and supplies, which takes you to our store at Little Green Workshops. Um, and yeah, there's a, a full blog. So Little Green Cheese. This is where I put. Things of interest when I'm not doing YouTube videos, if that makes sense. Um, so, yeah, there's a blog. There's a full blog. There's where you can pick up my one ebook. Do I have whether you can pick up the other one? No, I should fix that and put that in there. Where the merch is, where the kits are, all that sort of stuff. Go to Little Green Cheese. So, very cool. Um, yeah, there we go. Okay. Um, more questions somebody says happy birthday kim yeah indeed thank you cheryl that's great um and she does send her love and well wishes to everybody on the chat she said had a great have a great show and say good day to the curd nerds for me look fingers crossed and i'm not going to promise anything hopefully next week during the 12 hours of cheese i'm hoping to have an appearance of the lovely kim live she's been on the show before um, but yeah, it'd be nice to see her. I think during the smoked cheese test, it's going to be very hard to keep her away from that. So, uh, yeah, that, that'll be good fun. Mm. All right. Um, Herb says he has a batch of bland from way almost three months aged, uh, tasting in a couple of weeks. You know, I've got a bland now that's been in the bottle for a year or is it two years? I can't remember, but it looks great. I've got to try it. It's it's very mature. I've made two now, and this one I thought, no, let's just age it. Forget about it, Gav. Just drink the one from before, 
and uh, yeah, see see what it tastes like. All right, um, last question. I got five minutes to go. Um, um, Lacrette says, "Do you use ham radio or Echo Link on two meters, seventy centimeters?" No, I don't. I, you know what? I used to be when I was in the navy. I was a radio operator, uh, and we used to operate all of the HF, UHF, VHF uh, radios uh, for the ship, for the warships. Um, and uh, yeah, so I didn't do any ham radio per se, but I can send Morse code at eighteen words a minute. Uh, no, hang on. Yeah, 18 words a minute, sometimes up to 22, but it's unintelligible. And I can read it at 18 words a minute. Probably not so much now. I need a bit of practice. Um, so, yeah, I learned Morse code when I was 16 years old. So, And uh, honed the school during the, the Gulf War. It always goes back to the simplest form of communications. We had to read Morse code to get weather information of all things, would you believe? So, yeah. Um, but, yeah, cryptography and all that sort of stuff, tell it. Teletype, it's changed a lot these days now that we've got the internet and satellites. So, um, yeah, that was way back in the 80s and 90s. Anyway, um, next question, last question for the day. Let's have a look. Um, Celeste has a great question. It says, hi, Gavin, will changing the shape or size of the mould, making it taller, smaller radius cheese, instead of a larger, flatter wheel, Influence the maturation time or outcome, say, with uh, tome or alpine cheese. Yeah, the larger the cheese, the longer it needs to mature for those flavours to develop, Celeste. The smaller the cheese, the, lo the, the, the least amount of time it needs to develop. So, yeah. Um, taller and taller doesn't really, the radius, not so much. There's more pressing pressure. Um when you've got a taller cheese, you need to press it a little bit more. But a lot of the taller cheeses are um, pressed by gravity. They're, you know, the mold ripened cheeses like um, Formed on Bear and, uh, you know, Stilton is in a big cheese as well. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's not so that much the mold sh shape. It's the size of the cheese itself that takes longer. That's why, you know, those big 70 kilo Parmesans take, you know, between 12 months and two years to mature, where ours only... On the lower side, between 10 and 12 months, I wouldn't cut into it any time before 10 months or you don't get the flavour. So, But definitely. All righty. All right. Can we sneak in one more? Let's have a look. Who's this? Um, bah, bah, bah. Um, uh, <laughs> Patricia's got a good anecdote. It says, um, Cheryl, so funny. Uh, she was talking about the cheese thing. I started making cheese because nobody around me was making cheese. Being the only kid on the block means uh, doing it means I'm never second best, lol. <laughs> it's so true. So true. You can impress anybody with your cheese making. It's like a superpower, Patricia. Superpower cheese making. Indeed, people are in awe that you can do these things. Um, certainly the people that I talk to, they're in awe that I make my own cheese. They thought it was just something special people did. But no, you can do it at home. It's a hobby thing. Anyway, that'll do. That'll do. Um, thank you so much for watching today. It's been wonderful having you all on here asking your questions. Don't forget that if you want to learn to make cheese uh, and don't want to watch the YouTube videos, um, there is a full beginner's course that I've created over at the Curd Nerd Academy. Go to courses.littlegreenworkshops.com.au and you can sign up. The course is $150 Australian, which is not much. Uh, and you learn to make nine cheeses, plus all the background uh, of cheese making and why we do certain things a certain way. So, and if you want to pick up supplies, then pop over to, like I said, littlegreenworkshops.com.au. And a few people have put through orders this morning already, which is fantastic. And thank you very much. Uh, if you want to pick up any merch, I won't say like this cup because this is a cup that Kim bought from Ikea. Not the cup. I can't find my other one. Um, if you want to pick up any merch, T-shirts, the like, all that sort of stuff, pop over to YouTube.com slash Gavin Webber, my channel, of course. And there's a tab now. There's a store tab. And it takes you through to where all the merch is. So, so cool. Thank you, everybody. 
I appreciate you asking me the questions because without the questions, there wouldn't be a show, would there? So I will see you next week in the 12 hours of cheese. We're starting an hour earlier so I can fit it all in before I fall asleep at seven o'clock at night, my time. So it'll be an hour earlier. Don't miss the start. Very special. And then we've got a whole raft of interviews in my morning. And then you saw the you saw the sessions. Anyway, all good fun. It's going to be fantastic. Thanks for watching, Curd Nerds. And I'll see you next week. 12 hours of cheese. Don't miss it. It'll be great. See you later. Bye-bye.